talk about some more advanced JavaScript. We talked last time about uh, function properties and one of these things. That uh, every JavaScript object has a prototype. Every prototype is an object. And JavaScript objects inherit their properties and methods from their prototype. Um, so this is an object constructor. We're using the function to create an object. We're going to pass in these primitives. So the object will have a name, uh, a property first name, last name, and age. And we're going to set those here. You're going to call new to create this new object. <coughs> now you can add new properties on the fly. So here we created this um, person object, me. Now I'm going to add a property favorite food as pizza. We could add a property to the prototype which would be this person is the prototype and we're going to say person favorite food and just give it an empty string now when you do that <coughs> every person's um, object so me I would have a favorite food if I didn't have one before and it would be an empty and every object that gets instantiated after that would also have the favorite food and it would default to null because we don't have any way to set it in the constructor. <coughs> we can add methods to the object. Um, we're going to add a getter function to retrieve the first name and last name of me. But this only applies to the me object that we've instantiated here. It doesn't apply to all all persons. Um, so we can we can let's add to that constructor that we made initially. We'll add that function now. Every person that's instantiated will also have the get name um, getter method. Um, we could also do that same thing here by using person prototype get name and then adding that function as a reference to get name in the prototype and that will accomplish the same thing um, as we saw in the previous slide the the benefit to this though is that you can extend um, so jQuery for example we can extend jQuery by looking at the object constructors and um, extending those by adding functions to them. Um, add another one to um, set the favorite food since before we added the um, the property of favorite food but they, we added an empty string. Now we have a way to um, add in the favorite food and then we'll set it here. I believe that you had some uh, serialization framework and JSON experience in a previous class now. Um, so Ajax is uh, it's called asynchronous JavaScript and XML, but that's not it's not a very good description of it. Uh, basically, we're, we're we are making asynchronous data calls usually to um, a server. We can either post to a server or get get from a server. And here's how you would call that. You'd use the uh, jQuery object <coughs> and use the Ajax function. We're going to pass it this object here, which contains the URL that we're going to call. And then we're, when that gets done, when this call completes, it'll either um, be successful, it will fail, 
Um, and then you can have this always do this. And we're passing it the success callback. And the callback is a function that we're passing as an argument to another function. So in the previous example, success callback is a reference to a function that is called when the AJAX request completes successfully. Um, and it's only called then. If it, if it fails, it'll call the fail callback. Um, and it will always call the always callback, regardless of whether it passes or fails. So when we are When we are using the AJAX call, most of the time, I don't want to say most of the time, but I'd say in my experience, at least two-thirds of the time, you're going to have issues, and especially if you're working in Internet Explorer, then you might as well just give up. But uh, you're going to have to add some parameters here, some properties to this object. Sorry. And on one of those that may be necessary to add is uh, data type JSONP. Uh, JSONP is it's a way to transfer um, JSON data as JavaScript to get around some of the um, security settings that are in place, the cross-origin research resource sharing and the same origin policy, which you can read about here. Also, um, if you have a JSON file or any data on your in your local files and you are trying to test from your browser um, using the file system, you won't be able to do that with an AJAX call. Um, it'll give you an error for that. I talked about um, last time using um, Grunt to clean up code. Um, one of the grunt modules um, is JS Lint, and the other one is JS Hint. And these were created to um, clean code. It gives suggestions to um, problems that it notices, uh, like if you create a function within a loop, it will tell you you shouldn't do that. It might also give you um, suggestions um, for variables layout. At, it's pretty in, intensive, actually, which is why I prefer JS Hint. Um, I think it's a little, it's really still a good tool, but it's not as um, restrictive. One of the things, for example, would be that JS Lint um, will only allow you to use spaces to um, indent your code. If you use tabs, it will throw an error and it will error out before it gets to the end of your file and then um, you you just have a hard time actually getting anything done with that. Now you can set parameters and whatnot to tell it to ignore certain things but I, I find it easier just to use JSN. Talk about jQuery and um, some other libraries a little, a little more. <coughs> so last, last time we looked at accessing elements in the DOM, and we're going to look at some other things that we can do, um, like loops and whatnot. So here we're looking at uh, event listeners. So when we click an element on the page, or when we type on a page, or hover over something on a page, we can actually set up event listeners in jQuery to catch those events in the browser and then do something with them. And here we set up a, a listener to listen for a click on the element with the ID submit. And once that's clicked, it will get passed into this function and we can do something. We've passed in this E. Uh, a lot of times you'll see it written out as, as actually event. Um, I prefer E because it's shorter and I think it's pretty obviously obvious what it is. We can also create an event listener on the document 
sorry, this uh, dot shouldn't be there. Um, dot on, uh, click, and tell it to um, look for the submit element, and then do something in there. Um, often you'll see um, prevent default or stop propagation, and those can be helpful if you ever find yourself clicking on something and the page reloads, you probably need to add prevent default. Um, you probably have done something that uh, clicked on an element that has uh, like a button, oftentimes the submit button will force a page uh, refresh. So what we're going to do is catch that and actually tell it not to do that default action that uh, jQuery would normally have it do, or JavaScript. Um, stop propagation is useful, say, if you have a drop-down menu and you click one of the elements, um, but you want it to open up another uh, step-down drop-down menu instead of selecting that object and closing the drop-down, you would use stop propagation. It basically stops that event from bubbling up um, to the next object. So we can access the element that was clicked, um, and the, the current target would be, like I said, events basically they bubble up from uh, the source to whatever else might be listening to them. Um, and we can figure out what what is in here right now by using current target. So that event, current target, um, we're storing that in target element, and I didn't use far. Shame. Uh, and then we're going to get the ID from the target element, and then that element, that ID would be um, submit. Some of the common events, like I said, click, double click, focus, um, change you can use, but you can only use it in an input box, or uh, an input uh, element, a text area, or in a, a select, which is the, the drop-down menu select. Um, hover. And you have keyboard down and keyboard up, and you also have uh, key press. Um, key down would, would operate when the finger is still down on the button. Um, this allows you to fire the event while the while the user is holding the button down and then you can fire another event when the finger is released from the button. You can also trigger the events programmatically in JavaScript um, by choosing the ID and then uh, calling the function trigger and telling it what event you want to trigger. This would work for click. You can add focus, give focus to uh, the element, uh, emulate hovering, etc. Um, in JavaScript, we can iterate over the elements in on the DOM, and here we're going to look at a uh, unordered list. <coughs> called my list, and we're going to look to look at each of the um, list items. We've got this um, array that we've uh, declared here, instantiate it with an empty array, and we're going to use the syntax push to push the text of this list item. So as we go through here, the, each one will become the object this, and we're going to get its text and push that text into the list item array. And here we see um, function that is passed i, and that is the index. So we didn't use it in this example, but we will later. <coughs> so we can iterate over um, things that aren't 
uh, the elements from the DOM as well. So we can use these instead of uh, the normal for uh, I equals zero colon semicolon uh, I is less than the array length. You know that that style of for loop. We can we can use in each uh, to iterate this array. We've got our array here with uh, one through five. This function it has the arguments index and value. So in here we actually have um, access to those. <coughs> and instead of um, writing to the array this time, we're going to actually um, look at the my list um, unordered list here. And we're going to add these list items. Um, this is a special way that you can create a uh, a new element here. We're actually going to create this list item and then um, give it a text value of the text of whatever the value is and then append that to the DOM. Actually append that inside my list. So it'll this will become the last element in the unordered list my list. <coughs> um, underscore is another library. I, it's not a replacement for, for jQuery, but it, it provides extra functionality <coughs> that can be used in combination for, for great effect. Um, instead of jQuery dollar symbol, we're going to use the underscore. And we're going to compare um, what we've just done with how underscore would, would do this. Um, so we have our uh, array here again. And we just use underscore.each. And you'll notice that the index and the value from, from JavaScript, the JavaScript each, are reversed. Another difference with the underscore each is that you can't use a break statement. So you can't um, find what you're looking for and say break and jump out of that iteration because it, it won't work. <coughs> so you're going to iterate an object in underscore. Um, this is objects and, and arrays are where, where underscore really shines and, and how it does Java or jQuery. And I'll show you a couple helper functions later that, that really demonstrate this. Um, so here we're using the same syntax as before, except uh, you know we can we can change these actually to whatever we want them to be. But I wanted to make this obvious that that that's what we're getting here. So we're getting the value and then the key. <coughs> So um, we're going to append these list items to the my onward list here. And we're going to append it with the text, the key, and then the value. So in the first iteration, we'd have uh, A and 1. <coughs> so let's uh, look at some of those helper functions I was talking about. Um, I'm going to create a list here with these objects. Each one has a name and a role. This is one uh, pluck. Underscore dot pluck. We're going to give it the um, array of objects that we have. And we're going to just pull the names out. So if we just want to get these names, then it would return this list of names. Or we could find where a specific condition is met. So we're going to find in this object array, array of objects, where the object has the role of instructor. And in this case, only one does it will return this. <coughs> <coughs> we can also group by. So here we're going to group by. Sorry, these should all be people with. Uh, we're going to group by objects that have the role of student here. This one did not, and it's alone. And these three that have the role of student, so they're grouped together. Um, it also provides other helpers. So we can, instead of doing type of, we can check um, if it's not a number, if it's null, if an element is empty, if a variable is a function, or if it's undefined. There's also 
Underscore provides a templating library that we will be using in the in-class example exercise. Um, so it would really be helpful to look over the uh, underscore library link to there on the right here to uh, to get a good idea of how, how it's used and how useful it can be. I don't expect you to understand all of it, but if you could especially look at the template section, that'd be very helpful. <coughs> um, talked briefly last time about JavaScript frameworks. Um, the one that we use at Noesis is um, Backbone. They're uh, actually Backbone in combination with Marionette. Um, Angular is very, very popular. Um, there are other popular frameworks as well, but, but the whole point of using a framework is that JavaScript is very easy to write because it's a scripting language. You can write on the fly, you can make changes in the, in the browser, and and they they take effect immediately. You don't have to recompile, and that's all great. Loosely typed is it's fun. It's awesome. Quick, quick, rapid prototyping, but it also gets sloppy really quick. Um, it leads to really poorly written code, poorly laid out code. <coughs> um, so using a framework can really help you organize, plan, and and modularize helps maintain your code. Um, so we're going to convert uh, the previous class's uh, assign uh, in-class exercise into a uh, framework web app for the second class. Um, Backbone and Marionette. Um, Marionette is basically just an extension of Backbone. It requires it. Um, lots of the same things, but just a couple little additional features. Uh, Backbone, anyway, is a, it's provides a model views and collections kind of um, the MVC paradigm that's used by uh, most uh, well uh, a lot of object-oriented programming, um, especially iOS. You you are forced to use the MVC. There's no other way. Um, and it also um, provides some abstractions for, for AJAX calls. Um, it doesn't really reduce the code, uh, but, it, but it helps um, to, like I said, modularize everything. Um, event bindings can be created. Um, the syntax is a little different, but, but I think it really helps clean things up. And it can also listen for changes in your models. So if you have a model that um, uh, you've gotten from a server, and uh, or you add a new model, <coughs> it will actually update your view automatically so that you see the model without you having to tell it to do it. It will listen for changes on your models. Um, if you, I suggest uh, checking out this example. This is the code, which you can actually uh, check the uh, working example of this project. Look over that code. Also, um, the basic stuff that's there is also in the uh, zip file that you have for the in-class. <coughs> you can look at it and uh, see the differences between what we're going to do and, and what they've done. And that's it for today. So please uh, um, read the uh, material that's uh, posted in the README file on the zip and uh, prepare for.